thank you all for coming to the second edition of Art Talk Tuesday at Brand Library and Art Center, um, which take place the first Tuesday of every month here in the Recital Hall. My name is Jennifer Romanchek, and I am on the curatorial team for the City of Glendale's Art and Culture Department. Art Talk Tuesdays is an initiative created to foster dialogue within the arts and broader community and to introduce the many contemporary artists working in our midst to the citizens of Glendale and Los Angeles. We start with an artist lecture presented by the artist, followed by a discussion between the artist and myself. Afterwards, we'll open things up to a public Q&A before closing. Um, and I also want to take a minute to thank um, Shannon Curry Holmes, Stacy V. London, who isn't here tonight, Chloe Kors, Kaylee Cannon, Issa Santos, and Barry Falls. Um, all of your help is necessary and appreciated. Um, so today I am pleased to introduce Dan Levinson, um, a Los Angeles-based visual artist working in installation, performance, video, painting, and sculpture. His work addresses issues of subjectivity, education, creativity, and freedom, and takes the form of artifacts rescued from the ruins of an imaginary art school the State Art Academy Zurich. Its initials in Swiss German are SKZ. As a painter, he follows the strict formalist pedagogy of his imaginary school, geometrically dividing metrically sized canvases to create abstract compositions. He expands on the story through performance, installation, and video. Levinson has taught performative drawing lessons taken from the school's curriculum at the Hammer Museum, the American Jewish University, and USC's Roski School of Art. Levinson is the recipient of the Pollock Krasner Grant and Yadaw and McDowell Fellowships, among other awards. He has attended the Skowhegan School of Art and has exhibited at the Hammer Museum, Field Matter Los Angeles, Honor Fraser, LAX Art, and White Columns, amongst others. He is represented by Praz Delavalade. What is it? How do you say it? Delavalade. I remember it because it sounds like Menomena. Yeah. But anyway, Praz de Lavalad, Paris, and recent projects include solo exhibitions with Praz de Lavalad, Los Angeles, and James Fuentes in NYC. Uh, without further ado, Dan Levinson, everyone. <clears throat> do you want your tea? I do. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, everybody uh, at the brand for making this happen, and thanks to everyone uh, for being here. Um, this is a postcard from the State Art Academy Zurich. That's what the text at the bottom says in Swiss German dialect. It's a language that I don't speak. Uh, this is the back of the postcard. It says the State Art Academy Zurich, uh, SKZ for short, is the art academy of the canton of Zurich and the largest and best art academy in Switzerland. Uh, the art academy has around 27,100 students. It was founded in 1990 and had in its first year 18 students and then it's stamped 1995. At the bottom it says printed in Switzerland and it says IKS. So the State Art Academy of Zurich is an imaginary art school that I invented and for more than a decade, um, all of my work as an artist has had something to do with this art school. So I'm going to try in this talk to give a um, history of my development as an artist. I'll try to talk about my uh, recent work and the questions and problems that I think that I've been struggling with all along. Uh, so something about my, the development of my thinking as an artist, and the talk is about 35 minutes. So uh, this is an artwork that I made in 1990. I'm not going to give the whole story of my life, but I was um, an undergrad, I was a freshman, and um, I show this just because it's evidence to me at least that I've had these same questions for a long time. Uh, on the left is a painting that I made that's kind of pastiche and imitation of the style of, of Philip Guston. Um, then there's a little square of rabbit fur that I thought it was making reference to Joseph Boys. And on the right is the same 
object in the Philip Guston pastiche painting, but in a style that I thought maybe an adult professional Dan Levinson in the future might have developed, like an imaginary style. Philip Guston was interesting to me when I was an undergrad because he was an artist who changed his work at least twice radically. He started off as a WPA um, kind of social realist painter during the Depression, and then he became an abstract expressionist and did more or less pure abstraction. And then late in life, he developed this unique, quirky cartoon style that um, was controversial. And so I, I guess I wondered what makes, how does an artist decide um, what kind of work they're going to do? How do you know what kind of form you're going to work with? How do you know what kind of style you're going to have? How do you develop a signature style? Is that kind of based in an ultimate um, kind of sense of your authenticity? Or is there something inauthentic about it? Is it like a concession to unfreedom? I guess I thought being an artist is something about freedom. And that if you're forced to stick to one thing, maybe that's kind of unfreedom. So that's what I was struggling with. And, you know, Philip Guston was interesting to me because had he repudiated his early work? Or how did he make these radical changes? So this is the prehistory of the State Art Academy's art, the years 2004 to 2009. This is an artwork that I started in 2004. And um, I printed this book two years later in 2006. Uh, it's a list of names. Uh, I took all the last names from a Zurich phone book. And I took a list of common first names for Swiss German people. And I uh, mixed them up in every possible unique combination that made tens of millions of unique Swiss sounding names. And then I printed them in this book. This is, I think, where I got that number 27,100 from. And I called the book Swiss Artists. I didn't, you know, at the time, I, uh, this was just funny to me. I, like, a lot of my ideas are intuitive and they're amusing to me somehow. So I think I always liked, in group shows, you see that list of artist names. Sometimes you've heard of them, sometimes you haven't. So this was kind of what that was about, like an infinite list of, like, Swiss artists in a group show. In 2006, I did this project in my uh, studio in New York. Um, it was a group show uh, of imaginary Swiss artists. I thought, like, young Swiss artists. I called it New Swiss Art. And I did this performance where I was, like, the gallery assistant. And uh, I based this performance on this guy. I don't know his name, but this is a photo I probably took on my Motorola, Motorola flip phone in 2006. This is the entrance of Mary Boone Gallery in Chelsea in New York. And this guy, uh, he was always there. And I, you know, I think I liked the kind of corporate aesthetics. He's wearing a suit. There's the table, the computer, and the binders behind him were also interesting to me. There's that. Um, Art historian Benjamin Buglo wrote an essay about the aesthetics of administration. So there was something about that kind of like art world fetishism of corporate efficiency or cleanliness. Uh, this is another gallery showing the binders. And I learned around this time that those binders are special binders. It's a company called Lights, L-E-I-T-Z. That's the company that actually invented the three ring binder and the whole bunch. It's a German company, originally. Um, I think it's now owned by a Swedish company. So this gallery, you see these lights binders in art galleries, and they have to be imported from Europe, and they are A format. Um, A4 is international metric paper size. I think practically every country on Earth uses it, except the United States. We use 8.5 by 11. So this was interesting to me because it's like these art galleries fetishize this kind of European aesthetic. They don't do their own um, correspondence on A4 paper, but they want to have these European-looking special binders. They don't want the crappy binders that you get at Staples. So they're somehow fetishizing um, an image of modernity. A format is part of the metric system. They're fetishizing Europeanness and internationalism. 
This is another shot of that group show. So here I made these kind of generic abstract paintings. This was the new Swiss art. Uh, I think I wasn't really satisfied with the arbitrariness. Of, like I didn't like the idea that I was kind of inventing all these different styles for this group show. Something about that didn't feel satisfying. The furniture all came from Ikea. It was like a low budget performance, and the binders that I made are just the free FedEx boxes that you get, and I painted them black and put stickers on them. Um, this is an installation that I did in 2009 at a not-for-profit gallery in the Lower East Side of Manhattan called Participant Inc. It was a group show, and in the back of the group show I did this installation that was supposed to look like a uh, Swiss art gallery office. So I built this desk. Um, the boxes uh, contain paintings on the left, those brown boxes. Then the white cardboard boxes are supposed to be like the records of the art gallery, you know, binders full of information about many, many Swiss artists, and that calendar on the wall. Um, and I based the whole tableau again on these uh, scenes that you see in the entrance of uh, Chelsea Galleries. This is Barbara Gladstone Gallery, a photo I took in 2009. And it's this funny little office with fluorescent lights and the tall desk. And then, you know, the gallery assistant is part of that tableau. You know, it's often a young, attractive person, often a woman. So more about kind of somehow fetishism in the gallery world. This is me in my studio building the desk. I wanted it to be larger than any desk in Chelsea, so I went around and I measured all those, the heights of all those desks, because they're always kind of absurdly high, so you can only see the top of the assistant. So I made mine a few inches taller. You can also see in Barbara Gladstone that uh, the gallery, the desk sort of floats above the polished cement floor, as do the walls. I think there's a name for that in German, but I'm not going to try to pronounce it. So I did that with my desk also. And here's the desk. Um, I put fluorescent lights in it. I got the correct light binders. And then um, there was no actual artwork visible in my little gallery, but um, this, those boxes say a Swiss standard painting um, and 74 centimeters square. And all the paintings were kind of the same drip of painting. So, I already had the idea that I wanted to work with the theme of standardization. You know, I thought Swiss standard painting, again, like it just sort of amused me. It felt right intuitively. But, you know, 74 centimeters, that doesn't, that's not a standard. You know, I, it was, there was something arbitrary still that wasn't sitting right with me. And the drip paintings, you know, why is that? What's standard about that? Uh, and then more about fetishism. I wanted there to be some kind of little narrative about the gallery assistant who, you know, was never visible in the installation. So uh, there's her pack of cigarettes. Um, this is an imaginary Swiss brand of cigarettes. It says Swiss quality, 20 cigarettes, and letzte means last in standard. German. So I silk screened this and I used the pattern from those Swiss standard paintings. There's her ashtray. Uh, the cigarette butts say lecht, which is the same word meaning last, but in Swiss German dialect and you know, lipstick traces. There's her cardigan, it was sprayed with her perfume. Um, there's her water glass. Um, the lipstick was provided by another artist in the exhibition, Vaginal Davis, so I was happy to be in this show. And it wouldn't be uh, fetishism without shoes, so her shoes were under the desk, although uh, visitors couldn't see that, so there was something kind of hidden or secret. Um, and it's an imaginary brand of uh, shoes, Hanali, so I stamped that in gold leaf. It turns out that the most kind of prescient part of this uh, Installation was this. I silk screened these. This is a Swiss standard art gallery calendar. Um, and it says September 1997. In addition to um, all my work taking place in this imaginary Zurich, imaginary Switzerland, it all takes place in an imaginary 1997.
So that was my painting, say, 1997. This is the first A-format artwork that I made. Um, so it's an A1 size calendar, and I imagine if you buy calendars, wall calendars in most of the world, they will be A1 size, standard paper size. Movie posters are this size, many pieces of paper. So this is the beginning of uh, State Art Academy Zurich, which I started working on around 2008. I already knew with this installation that all of the artists uh, in this imaginary gallery knew each other and had gone to the same art school together. So I knew something about the art school. And I had a sense that, you know, this question that always haunts me about what makes a professional artist has something to do, you know, with the dividing line between being an art student in an art school and being a professional artist in an art gallery. So you go from like one institution to another, and something about that change. And also that it has something to do with standardization. There's a way that uh, education has something to do with standardization. Um, and I knew that the artworks, I wanted the artworks to address that, but I hadn't quite figured it out. So the answer was something between this, you know, the Swiss standard painting and this Swiss standard art gallery calendar. This is, um, shows uh, the uh, ISO international paper standard size part of the metric system. A0 is a square meter in area, and if you fold it in half this way, you get A1, which is half a square meter in area. So this is the only kind of rectangle uh, that if you fold it in half, it makes a rectangle with the same ratio of 1 to the square root of 2. That's why they chose it for the metric system, because folding paper, it just makes sense. You tear it in half, and you get another. And then up in the upper left corner, you can see A4. That's international paper size. So after I did that exhibition of the gallery office, I thought I need to make paintings in these A format sizes. So I spent, I don't know, probably six months, I spent way too much time making stretcher bars. I kind of went crazy. I, I didn't study woodworking. I wanted to figure out a way of doing this. Um, I'm still using this store of stretcher bars that I, it's one of the only things I brought with me when I moved to LA. Uh, so these are the stretchers, these are A1 size. This is an A3 size stretcher, and you can see uh, the electric brand. Um, IKS, Integrated Art Services, is an imaginary art and office supply company that reappears frequently in my work. Excuse me, the calendar is also from this company. There's the brand on our sculpture. So in 2011, I did uh, a project at a non-profit artist-run space in Philadelphia called uh, Vox Populi. This is the SKZ student monochrome workshop, and I was inspired by the Bauhaus, this famous uh, German early 20th century art school uh, that was based on the workshop system. Um, so in this classroom, room 17, in the SKZ, the State Art Academy Zurich, I imagined that these students were working on an advanced project, a final project, of doing black monochrome paintings. And again, something about it amused me. There's like the monochrome painting is something that haunts uh, modernism, it haunts 20th century art, and I always thought of it as um, like the ultimate painting. You know, art is always dying, painting is always dying, it's always coming to an end, um, and yet it never does. When I was in, I think I was in high school maybe, or maybe I was even in grade school, there was an exhibition at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston called Endgame. And even though I didn't know anything about art, I was a little kid, and like, I interpreted all these artworks as being like, what, what would be like the last ultimate artwork that you could make? So that's what these students are doing. Um, oh, and these paintings are double A0 size. Uh, in 2012, I moved to Los Angeles, and I wanted my studio to be like a classroom in the SKC. So I built these floors, I built this desk and the chair, and they're all supposed to be artifacts from this art school. 
Uh, the floors are 4A0 size, and I liked the idea that they kind of, you know, collect the marks of my work, they collect paint, but um, they're not exactly artwork, and they're, you know, I've heard that, uh, although I've never been, there's the Jackson Pollock Museum uh, in Long Island, and you can see the floor that he painted on, and it's, you know, spattered with paint, and it looks like a Jackson Pollock. There are a couple other artworks that are um, studio floors. There's a Joseph Boys uh, artwork and a Dieter Rote artwork. This is the uh, desk that I still work on in my studio. The surface of the desk is a double A0 size, so it's half of one of these panels and one sixteenth the size of the whole floor. Um, and uh, it packs flat like IKEA furniture. So there you can see the desk coming out. Here you can see sort of how it's really just uh, four pieces of plywood that come together. Um, I think IKEA is always like an inspiration to me. I think because it's part of the like the degradation of 20th century modernism. Um, in the early 20th century, um, designers at the Bauhaus and other places had high hopes for modern materials like plywood and melamine and plastic, and there was this idea called the Volkswohnen, um, probably mispronouncing that, but the people's living quarters, that um, modern construction techniques and modern materials would mean that everybody in the world could have like an efficient and modern and beautiful and affordable home. Um, and it's one of those promises uh, or part of the idealism of modernism that hasn't come true. Instead, what we have is IKEA, which is, you know, not the worst thing in the world, but it's definitely not what we were promised. And here are the flat files that I built that fit under the desk, and they fit A1 size works on paper. Um, here is a student painting storage box. Um, this is a big part of my work. These are kind of lockers from the art school. This is from room 119. You can sort of see on the bottom 119. And it fits A3 size paintings. So this is usually where I tell a story, a kind of seminal story from my development. Also around 1990, I had a professor um, when I was an undergrad named David Saunders who taught us like traditional oil painting techniques and things that we wanted to know. And he also taught us how to frame a painting and how to uh, hang it on a gallery wall, how to light it, and how to photograph it. So I still photograph my own work. To demonstrate this, he took uh, a discarded student exercise that was left in, you know, a locker. It didn't look like these, but you know, something like that, on one of those Friedrichs canvas panels that art students use. And it was not, you know, not an interesting or beautiful painting. I think it was like a bowl of fruit that a student had you know, left behind. Uh, and we took it into the wood shop and we built an oak frame for it and we stained the frame and, and we brought it into an empty gallery and hung it on the wall and lit it at 45 degrees with the track lighting. And you know, when it was hung up on the wall, um, all of a sudden it, you know, it looked important and beautiful. It could have been like Pierre Bernard or something. Um, and so this was an important lesson for me, not just about the importance of context for art, because, you know, I think we've all experienced, you know, you see something in a white cube art gallery and it looks better than it did, I don't know, hanging in your bedroom or something. Um, context is important, but it's also something about the pathos, the feeling of uh, taking something that hasn't been appreciated or valued, something that's been discarded and unloved, and giving it kind of care and attention and elevating it. Uh, so something about that felt important to me, and I think that's still kind of what I'm trying to find in my work. So this is an exhibition that I did in 2015. Uh, Suzanne Finlmetter was called SKZ Painting Storage, and I wanted it to be like 
um, the back storage area from the art school. I also always like the storage rooms in art galleries. I think there's something really magical there, these storage racks and paintings that are wrapped in plastic. So I was trying to get at something uh, of that. And this is the other side of that room. I brought in my whole studio set up with the floors and the desk and the chair and the storage boxes. This is another artwork from that show. Uh, it's a shipping crate. Uh, it says Lake Zurich Logistics. So again, this is kind of amusing to me. Lake Zurich is the lake that the city of Zurich in Switzerland is on. Um, so this is like shipping, imaginary shipping and logistics company that instead of being global, it just kind of goes around this little lake. You know, so you can move artworks from one side of the lake to the other. Uh, and this is a performance that I did in 2016 in the Courtyard of the Hammer Museum. Um, it's, uh, I decided to teach a lesson from the curriculum of this art school. And the curriculum of the art school is something that I'm always trying to figure out and learn. And so this was really helpful to me in getting a clearer idea of what the State Art Academy of Zurich would actually be teaching their students. Uh, I wanted to have something real to teach these participants. These people were very brave. You know, people have stage fright, so they were up on stage. There's an audience that you can't see behind them. And people were also nervous that, you know, about taking a drawing lesson, although, you know, it didn't really involve any uh, drawing skill. Um, and here they are making these paintings. What I taught was something called uh, classical construction or straight edge and compass construction, which was a technique that um, was discovered by the ancient Greeks that allows you to do uh, very precise geometric drawings without using numbers. So it's a kind of mathematics, but it doesn't use numbers. And for the ancient Greeks, these discoveries uh, were sort of connected to some sense of the divine. So here I am showing how to divide the diagonal line into equal sections. I'm just using a straight edge, so there's no marks of measurement on that piece of wood. And, and then we did a formal analysis. This is kind of like an obsolete way of talking about art that was practiced in the first half of the 20th century at places like the Bauhaus, where you don't say, you know, uh, whether the painting is beautiful or ugly, you don't say which one you like more, you just talk about formal categories. Uh, so I'll return to that. Happy participants, <laughs> friendly, you know, nice teacher. That's <laughs> the vibe I'm going for. Um, and these are some of the props that I made for this performance. This is called a drawing horse. It's a piece of furniture um, that is common in like life drawing classrooms in art schools. So you sit on it uh, facing that upright piece and then you have a drawing board. Of course the drawing board is A1 size. Mm -hmm. I sewed these aprons that whole summer of 2017. I sewed these um, linen aprons and the square of linen is of course A1 size. The corners are just folded behind and the um, Apron strings are exactly a meter long. And it also amused me that it was, uh, these are oil on linen. So again, it's like, it's the same material as a valuable painting, oil on linen, but it's something that you would discard rather than, you know, hang on the wall. Okay, so here's a, uh, a video. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hear it's less than a minute long, but it's a video of the um, of the performance. Early on, when I was deciding that maybe I wanted to be an artist as a profession, I began to wonder how it is that artists find what kind of artist they're going to be. Let's call it individuation. And that is the subject matter of the project that we're doing today. Starting from some very simple rules, there's a variety of results. Thank you very much. And please take your paintings with you.
Oh. Fast forward through all of these. Um, so I think you could see, like, briefly up on the chalkboard was a list of the, like, uh, categories. Um, these formal categories. Okay, this is an installation that I did in uh, 2017 at um, an art fair. Again, it's like a um, classroom from the art school. On the wall. There's another view of that. Uh, here's another performance and installation that I did in 2017 at uh, this building called the House of the Book in Simi Valley. Um, this was through American Jewish University. Um, you know, people who know the Power Rangers, I guess, recognize this building. But it's a beautiful old brutalist building from the uh, early 1970s. This is the interior rotunda of the building, and this is my installation. It's supposed to represent a classroom, another uh, kind of lesson taking place in, in the art school where students are learning to make monochrome diptychs. A diptych is just uh, two paintings side by side that form a single artwork. So up on the um, dais there, is that the word for it, um, is the um, exemplar, like what they're studying from, and then there are the their exercises. And then I did another one of these performative art lessons, the same idea. I taught them uh, straight edge and compass construction, classical construction. They made these abstract paintings. Friendly teacher explaining how to use the straight edge and compass. And then formal analysis. Here are some formal categories, you know, size, shape, line, balance. I had people brainstorm these. Um, ways of talking about art that are not, um, that are supposed to be objective. This is, again, like part of the lost idealism of uh, early 20th century modernism. Okay, there's another video. Again, this is like uh, less than a minute. The origin is that early on when I was trying to decide whether I really wanted to be an artist, I started to wonder how artists become who they are as individuals and as groups of artists. And that's also the subject matter of this exercise that we're going to be doing. I mean, when I was in elementary. Composition could be harmonious or it could be dissonant. Rhythm. Rhythm is a great one. So uh, just prior to the pandemic, I did a series of uh, performances with um, small children called uh, SKZ uh, Children's Painting Workshop. Uh, and my idea was to have uh, that the art school has a kindergarten attached to it, like you know, maybe something like a daycare center, but that from an early age, you know, from preschool or kindergarten, students, uh, kids start learning the same lessons that the adults learn. Uh, so I painted these banners, I made these uh, easels, I made the smocks for the kids, and then I silk screened these um, coloring sheets for them to use. Cute toddler. Um, I'll show you another video. Again, less than a minute. I'll give you a sense of what it looks like.
Look what you made. Very nice. Oh my goodness. So uh, I built these uh, easels for children. Of course, it's two A1 sized rectangles. I uh, silk screened these uh, A1 format children's uh, drawing sheets. Um, here's the easel with a kid's painting on there. And I made these um, aprons. I mean, I think it's sort of the same idea as all of my work, that I wanted everything, to, everything in their environment kind of reinforces what they might do. I didn't give them any instructions. I didn't say you need to fit color in the lines or anything. Um, but, you know, the, the lines are there, and it's a strong suggestion. And the smocks and the banners all kind of reinforce a message. And, you know, I think this relates back to my question about creativity and freedom and, you know, that uh, freedom doesn't take place in, you know, that there are certain constraints. But it's a matter of knowing, you know, what, what constraints are um, necessary, like what we can't overcome immediately, and what constraints are things that we've internalized without being aware of them and that we maybe don't need to, we could disregard, you know, we could color outside the lines to be blunt about it. But, you know, obviously with freedom there is like, um, somebody said freedom is the recognition of necessity. You know, you can't be free from like breathing or, you know, eating. People do try to be free from eating, but um, it leads, you know, to a very specific and um, predictable result, you know. But there are ways that we can be free. You know, there may be lines that we, we don't have to color inside. So, um, in terms of like, you know, decisions and arbitrariness, when the pandemic started, I, I looked back on this project and this work and, and these smocks. I had chosen, you know, six bright colors, red, yellow, and blue primary colors, and then black, white, and green. Um, and I, I filled in these smocks, you know, according to my whim. And again, that didn't really feel right. It didn't feel like it fit with the art school. Like, why am I making these arbitrary choices and trying to make the smocks look like they were random? So I thought they should be really random. And so I made this uh, wooden six-sided die. It's red, yellow, and blue, black, white, and green. Um, chance, yeah, I, I decided I'm not going to talk too much about like kind of like art historical references, but it was some, again, part of like early 20th century modernism, uh, Dadaism, especially this artist Hans Arp is, uh, was credited by the other Dadaists with kind of being the first to introduce chance operations they called them into his work by, he cut up a drawing and dropped it onto a piece of paper and then the cut up drawing where the pieces landed, that became the final drawing. Um, and, it, you know, this idea of chance recurred in the 1960s with John Cage and other people. Something about, like, you know, escaping the tyranny of your own choices. Like, I, you know, was this, I thought, well, I'm, you know, making random choices of, but I'm not, I don't know. Some, something about it is predetermined. I'm not articulating that well because I don't fully understand it myself. So I started making these uh, paintings where every shape in these little forms was decided by rolling the dice. Um, so, yeah, here's a little video. There's my dye, comes out white. And then I, you know, mark. W is for Weiss in German. So again, I don't speak German, standard German, I don't speak Swiss German dialect, but uh, I, you know, I use the W's for the German word. And this is a large painting that I uh, made using this technique. Uh, rolling the dice, a randomly generated painting. Um, and this is where that book comes back in, you know, the Swiss artist book. So I haven't mentioned before, but the paintings that I make 
are not signed with my name. They're signed with these randomly generated Swiss names that I think of as being students from the art school, from the SKZ. And this student is Lizia Kreis. Uh, here's the back of a smaller painting, Fabia Kofel. Um, and this is the book again, uh, you know, with the list of names. So I just go down the list and the next title of the painting, the next student is predetermined and every name only appears once and I don't know anything about the students in terms of like, um, you know, their backstory or whether they became professionals. It's really, you know, there was that, I think there was the Black Mountain College exhibition at the Hammer Museum a few years ago and there were a few student artworks. Like, I've, I've always liked that, um, artworks by students and you know, it's not necessarily important. You know, they're not a famous artist necessarily, but you can sort of appreciate the artwork just for itself and not for the name attached to it, I think. Maybe that's part of my idea. And then um, I decided that this should be a, a game. So this is Chance Operations with form and color for all ages. There's the IKS, this imaginary company again. Um, you know. It's a game that supposedly teaches um, formalist painting lessons. Here, I'll show this video. These are just people in my studio that I'm kind of experimenting on, and they're making, uh, they're making, a, they're playing this game, uh, rolling the dice, and then you know, for space number eight, they have to choose. Uh, and not black, they have to choose mm -hmm. a black shape that fits in there. And uh, that's the painting that they made um, by collectively rolling the dice. So it's, you know, random abstract painting. Uh, this is an exhibition that was this past August here in Los Angeles at Pras de la Um Those plinths have these uh, proposals that I made there. So it's like a maquette, a miniature classroom, and it's a, a proposal for a, an installation and performance that I would like to do someday somewhere. So this is like an expanded version of the kindergarten performance that I did with more than six kids this time and in a mirrored environment like the Yoi Kusama infinity rooms. So, you know, it's like an infinite classroom. And um, yeah, I would like to do this somewhere. So if you have any ideas. Uh, here's another view of it. That's a maquette. Here's an overhead view of the uh, mirror box and the uh, miniature mannequins with miniature randomly colored aprons. Here's a miniature um, child size easel. It's a color photocopy of an actual painting that I'm one of the participants in the workshops that I ran in. And here's the other um, proposal that I made for that exhibition. Um, this would be a classroom uh, where I would uh, teach this um, chance operations game and uh, students would make these randomly generated abstract paintings. And the furniture is also, you know, the same kind of flat pack um, IKEA furniture, but the colors uh, are randomly generated in the same way that the paintings are. So, Again, it's about kind of removing your subjectivity or revealing how your subjectivity is already determined for you by coordinates that you didn't choose. And that's it. Um, thank you. question that I had for you in your um, studio, but I, I kind of wonder if your presentation added um, some insight for me. How are we doing on that? Are you, are you doing okay with the microphone? Yeah, I'm just I'm anxious, so this is how I deal with it. Okay. Um, okay, so, well, I asked you, why create a fictional school, okay? And I'm going to let you answer, but I... Um, one thing that you were talking a lot about uh, during your presentation was um, promises, right? 
And I thought that that was sort of an interesting connection to, to fiction, because promises kind of exist in a, a sort of fictional realm. They can, I mean, they can become reality, but then they're not really a promise. They're like a tr truth, you know? Mm -hmm. But promise in and of itself is kind of exists as a fiction, yeah. right? So, um, I don't know, maybe you want to talk a little bit more about that yeah, angle towards fiction. Yeah, you mentioned something, something about that. Like, I, I'm, I haven't thought enough about, you know, fiction and narrative. It's something that's in my work, but I, I don't have a good answer. But, yeah, I mean, I think promises, there's something about, like, unfulfilled promises or, you know, things that are potential inside the world that haven't been actualized that's interesting to me. I think that's why I told that story about the discarded artwork, that it had some kind of unrealized potential that could still be realized. And I, I think I see the same thing, like, in... 20th century modernist avant-garde that there was some kind of hope. Maybe there was a real potential there. Maybe this is where fiction comes in. Like, maybe the potential wasn't there. You know, maybe it wasn't. I don't know. I tend to think it was, but you know, maybe it's more just the fact that it it, it inspires us with some kind of uh, idea that you know that we could have a better world or that we could really be free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's also kind of interesting because it speaks to that idea of like um, almost like the art world as serving that kind of a purpose, like a place where you can just do things that aren't necessarily going to like work in that to me the, is, the is real the, world. That to me is the utopian part of part of art is that it doesn't it doesn't have to prove that it has a function, you know, that it's allowed to just be. Um. I also wanted to ask a little bit, um, and this came up during the presentation, what, well I guess it maybe comes from almost a kind of like romantic impulse, like promises, but the, I mean, I understand, especially as an American caring about freedom, right, because it's like freedom is like <laughs> our sort of like thing, um, whatever, whatever somebody, whatever one might think of that. but. But you seem particularly fixated on it. So I was curious, like, where did that, was that like from a, um, a political standpoint, a personal standpoint? Like, where did that begin, like that focus on freedom? You know, I think it's a good question. It wasn't on the list of questions. I know, I know, I know. It's a really good question. That, that question is everything. You know, that's a, that question is everything. And I wish I had a really concise answer. I think, like, you know, when, when you're a kid, and for me, like being a kid, being interested in art, I didn't have any political ideas. Right. I, don't, I didn't have a, you know, criticism of society or a theory of art or anything. But art was like something that was just like fun and free time and space to exercise your imagination. And I think that you know, even even preschool kids can understand this. You know, you don't have to be able to articulate something politically or have a theory of society or a theory of art to understand it intuitively. I think I understood it intuitively early on and I'm still trying to figure out what it means. But yeah, I mean, it does have to do with politics. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we talked a, a little bit about this before, but about like this kind of like 90s artist that has this like large sort of um, um, narrative around their work, right, where everything kind of becomes a component of the narrative, right, so people like Matthew Barney, Mike Kelly, um, Andrea Zatel, um, and we, you know, your work kind of reminds me of that, but not so much in subject matter, um, more in the sense of that kind of overarching narrative and everything being kind of a, uh, almost like evidence of that narrative. Yeah, you know, I said earlier that, like, you know, I made these decisions in the past kind of intuitively because something was funny to me. I started, you know, I use the term fetishizing over and over again, but I started fetishizing the year 1997, probably like 2003, 2004, just because I thought it was funny. And back then, it was like the recent past. So in 2004, to sign a painting, 1997, was just sort of amusing to me. Now it seems like more significant because that was a really that really was the past. That's like history now. It's a long time ago. And and I think like you mentioned these three artists, I think that there's a way in which those three artists, um, their work, 
you know, took place in all different forms, all different media, and tried to address the big picture, tried to address society as a whole through its, their kind of scope. Um, you know, I think the fact that I signed all my paintings in 1997, you know, maybe I understand that more now. Maybe, you know, maybe I think of myself as like an artist from the 90s, you know? Mm -hmm. out, of, out of time, out of place. Oh, right, yeah. right, the constant. Yeah, well, and also, I mean, one of the reasons that I was really fascinated by um, um, this, like, creation of a fiction is that a lot of my work has tended to be, uh, well, two things, right? So, as an artist, but also as an arts writer, as an artist, a lot of my work has been kind of autobiographical. It comes from an impulse to, to want to understand the truth or what actually happened rather than what I would like to have happened or imagined happened. And so that's part of the reason I'm so interested in this like fictional impulse because I always feel like I'm spending so much time trying to understand what is actually happening that it's amazing to me like making all these things up like you know what I mean but um, but yeah I don't know like do you I mean I guess we never really got to like the, the sort of fictional impulse like where that comes from, but like what does it do for you that history doesn't, that um, autobiography doesn't, because those things have a role in this, but, but they're not at the forefront necessarily. Yeah, you know, I, I wish I had a better answer for that because the fiction aspect of it is something that I, I haven't thought enough about. Again, like there was a moment in the early 2000s where there were a bunch of artists doing um, there were a bunch of fictional artists, and there were artists creating other fictional artists, and you know this work comes out of that moment. You know, there's that gallery of Rena Spallings, that's a fictional artist. Mm -hmm. um, there's um, Claire Fontaine, is another uh, imaginary artist. There were a whole bunch of them in the early 2000s, and um, I have a you know funny relationship to it that I haven't quite figured out. I mean. The fictional aspect of my work is kind of like pared down to a minimum. Like I don't, I don't know the stories of these individual artists, and you know, I don't have a good theory of like maybe it's something to do with like distancing. I mean, I, I chose to set this art school in Switzerland, a country that I don't know, a language that I don't speak. It's important to me that you know, in a way, Dan Levinson is outside of it. You know, um, I'm like thinking out loud because I want to answer your question. Well, that's also kind of um, the dream of modernism a little bit, right? Isn't it the idea that you would get, that it's almost like you could create an objective reality that would solve problems? I mean, in a sense, I mean, that's one of the sort of like... Yeah, maybe. ...concepts of it. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily very personal. If you think about personal artwork, that gets more into like postmodern artwork. You know what I mean? That's when like you get all of the sort of subjective, um, highly subjective, highly personal things. But it's sort of interesting because you're doing this in the 90s and talking about it in the 90s, but a lot of that work, and even these three artists, it's like, yeah, they were creating these worlds, but their worlds were also so uniquely them. You know what I mean? Like, they were very personal in a way. Um, well, Mike Kelly's work was very autobiographical. Matthew Barney's had a little bit in there, but it becomes much more kind of strange and fictionalized. Yeah. And, and obviously, I mean, my work is all about me. I mean, there's no way I can escape that. But I don't want it to just be about my own navel gazing, although it is. I can't get, I can't get away from my own belly button. Um, yeah, well, you talk a lot about individuation, right? So what's interesting a little bit, one of the things that's interesting to me about the work is that it's sort of highly personal, but it's, it's also not highly personal in a, I mean, in a direct sense, but highly personal in the sense that like all artwork, when it becomes a certain amount of repetitive, reveals something about its author. Um, but like, what's interesting about this is that the subject matter itself is about becoming. Yeah. So it's not really about something that's become, you know what right. I mean? Whereas like, I feel like Mike Kelly kind of had a narrative 
You know what I mean? That it was like his narrative of like trauma. I mean that, and, and I mean Matthew Barney to me also had a narrative. It was very like kind of Freudian or something like that. You know, yeah. just pr pretty consistent. But the narrative here is more like how do you create your narrative? You, you know, know what I, mean? I mean, for me, like I'm still trying to to figure it out, and you know, like. It's it it gives, it gives me a little bit of hope that like you know it's only in the past couple of years that I figured out something about you know rolling dice that that could be um, something to do with the image of freedom and, and getting away from my own choices because mm -hmm. I might just make the same choices over and over again. You, I can get stuck in a rut in that way. And in terms of like fiction and autobiography, I wish I had a, a better answer for you. I think like. There's a way in which, you know, any story is a fiction because you choose to leave things out, you choose to bring things in, so it's a, it's a construction, at least. It's not false, but... Yeah, I mean, I could talk a lot about the malleability of memory, but I feel yeah. like that's a whole other thing. Um, um, yeah, like in imagined realities as like, um, as their own sort of fictional selves. Um, but I think it's a good time to turn it over if anyone has any questions. Any takers? I just have a, just a yeah. quick question. Do you want the microphone? No, not no. at all, no, no. I, I can speak loud. I, with the list of names, I mean, the one thing is it, it's amazing because it's just so immersive, like the entire concept of this over so, such a long period of time. Have you ever spent any time seeing if those names exist and that there's artists that are using those names? Have you ever had any of that crossover where you're signing a work of art under this fictional name that you've made up randomly and then it, it matched up with an artist who's making art? Um, I, you know, when I, I make a painting, I do often Google the name. Okay. It, it has never... I don't think it's ever turned out to be an artist. Okay. And I'm very gratified when it's a Swiss person, yeah. which is more often than not, you know, some of the names are, you know, it's like, comes up to somebody in Austria or Southern Germany. There's like gradations there sometimes. Some of the names are a little bit more Italian or French. Um, but, you know, I'm gratified when it's a Swiss person, but I don't think any of them have turned out to be actual artists. There's, there was like a race car driver. That was cool. <laughs> I'm just I'm overwhelmed, uh, impressed by just the scope of how in depth it is. Like from the books to the furniture to these maquettes to it's just remarkable the body of work. Thanks. Um, so in your practice, something that has always struck me is that. Everything's kind of pushed to the past. The paintings are aged and look much older than a painting from 1997. Um, and I'm, I also think about kind of the like modernist idea of non-objectivity in, in terms of freedom, where the painting is like liberated from the need to depict. Um, but then you have a complicated relationship with modernism by consigning it. So my question is, what do you want to happen? What do I want to happen in the present? In the future. In the future? <laughs> um, How would you like things to go, Dan? <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I think it's... I, I yeah. want to know what you think about modernism. Yeah. And why we no longer have access to it. That would be another way of phrasing the question. Damn, Zach, those are big questions. Those are, uh, I mean... They're both really good questions, you know. So, why do we not have it? What happened to modernism? Why don't we have access to it? And what do I hope will happen in the future? Uh, I, they're really good questions. I feel like both kind of a little bit over my head. And you also mentioned that, you know, like abstraction was a way of freeing artists from the need to depict. I was reading a really interesting essay that a lot of the early abstractionists viewed their work as like more realistic than realism, that they felt that there was like a kind of abstractness to the modern world that they were depicting in a realistic way. Why don't we have access to it? I think that 
has to do, you know, I'm not a good historian. Um, that has to do with the history of the 20th century, you know. The hopes uh, of the 19th century and of the early 20th century, the hopes that people had that kind of, um, you know, modern society and democracy and um, uh, the Industrial Revolution would lead to a better world, uh, you know, resulted in two world wars in Auschwitz and Hiroshima and Vietnam and Cambodia and thousands, uh, really thousands of horrors. When I think about the 20th century, I don't think it was like the fulfillment of those promises. So that's what happened to modernism. It's buried under that debris and all of the hopes of those generations, I think, are buried and we don't have access to it because we view it through the scrim of the last hundred years. Uh, so what do I hope in the future? I mean, I think like, at the least, I think people could maybe recognize what's been lost. I mean, I think I find it, it's depressing to me when people don't think that anything has been lost or like, um, um, I can't remember his name. There's that like psychologist at Harvard. I was on much part of one of his, he, he did that, uh, he wrote that book about how like everything is getting better and there's less violence and war in the world. Anyway, I watched part of his, one of his lectures last night. It's very depressing to me that that's, maybe it's good that I can't remember his name, but, what's that? Is it Malcolm Um, it's, 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 it's somebody like that. It's not Malcolm Gladwell. But it's, like, it's like one of those people that's sort of like, that is the worst thing to me. People not recognizing really um, what has happened and kind of what we've lost. Um, so I, I hope that, you know, for the future that people can recognize kind of the disaster of the last century and uh, that is something that has to be overcome if, if things are going to get better. That's too heavy for this talk, but you asked the question. Yeah. Um, I kind of got from it that, um, like, because you talked about the institution from um, university into galleries as an artist in, like, the real world or whatever. Um, and it kind of made me think about how, like, for lack of a better word, bullshit the institutions can be. Yeah. And then you kind of, to me, hit the mark on the way that artists, like, professors speak on art, right. and how even if you don't have the credentials to be a professor, you could, to a blind eye, be a professor. Like, if I did it, if out of context, if I didn't see you explain what the video was, maybe I would have thought you were a professor. So, yeah. I don't know, do you feel like that has anything to do with it, or am I just projecting? <laughs> um, I, I like your question, but I want to understand it a little bit better. You're asking me... Yeah. Um, like, just, do you feel like it, you are like a professor in speaking critically on the institutions at all? Yes. This piece? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm definitely like, you know, there was a movement, uh, or there, there's a group of artists from the 60s and 70s that people refer to as like institutional critique and that was something that was important to me. There was like, uh, especially an artist named Hans Hacke was really important to me when I was uh, an art student and um, yeah, I mean I'm critical of art school and I'm critical of, of art galleries. Um, like you said, there's a lot of bullshit there. I do think that there's something like also utopian there. Like, uh, there's some famous art schools that inspire me. The Bauhaus is the most famous one. There was um, uh, an art school similar to the Bauhaus in the Soviet Union called Vukutimas. There was a, an art school, it was kind of a descendant of the Bauhaus in the United States called Black Mountain College. And even like uh, CalArts here in, in Los Angeles in the 1970s, like there's some way in which like it could be like a, a real community where people exchange ideas and share ideas and collaborate. You, it's again like this unfulfilled promise, you know. 
it's something that could be great. I think you see that in education in general. Like, it could be really like opening your eyes to the world, learning something, growing, but the reality is something much more disappointing. Kind of the same. Museums were really interesting to me. I, when I thought about when I was deciding if I wanted to be an artist, I thought maybe I would work in a museum instead. And um, yeah, same kind of thing. Like they seem like these beautiful temples to uh, you know where art is really like valued. But it's not always the most fun place to work in reality. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and I was also wondering though, on another note. Do you use the block for your office? Do I use what? The random block for your office. Oh. <laughs> oh, right now? Oh, uh, no. Yeah, no, I should. Yeah. <laughs> it looks random. <laughs> I chose this outfit rolling the dice. What's that? It could be cool if you have, like, one of each color shoe, one of each color shoe. I should, like, I've had this yeah. fantasy that I could have, like, a uniform that I'd be wearing on. You know, like, I, I put this on and then I was like, the, this really clashes, like, the pink shirt, and it doesn't, it's not working, well, but, the and then I was like, I'm late, I'm just leaving. You know, like, thank you. Thank, oh, okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, it is kind of the same colors. You know, I, it's, it's more about, like, I moved to Los Angeles 10 years ago, and I moved here from New York, and I was like, I'm not, I used to wear all black, like, now I want to wear bright colors. I haven't quite got there yet, but, you know, I want to wear, like, really bright colors. Everyone <laughs> right here was wearing black. Too cool. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm going to close it out. All right. All right. Well, um, thank you for coming to the second, um, the second Art Talk Tuesday. We'll be back here next month. We won't actually be back here on the first Tuesday because it's so close to New Year's, but it'll be the second Tuesday of that month. So thank you for coming, and thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>